So here we are at the, uh, the Nibirin jungle. The idea was to create something that sort of felt like the uh, old Star Trek show, but make it a little bit more real. Three, two, one. Once we cut to our, our characters a few minutes into the movie, hopefully it fulfills the kind of promise that the end of the first film gave the audience, which was they're going to go off and have adventures. It's great to start the movie with this sort of Kirk Bones, you know, relationship like a like a old married couple that are at each other. You know, this is a classic Star Trek set. I mean, it really is. If it weren't for the fact that it's actually outside, which is wonderful because it breathes a whole lot of life into it, it's always much better to have the elements there that you can actually physically react to as opposed to you know having to use your imagination. The design department's done a phenomenal job. They really have, from the sets to the way that the Librians look. Yeah, it's coming together really well. We originally intended to go to Hawaii to shoot that sequence and we were going to do some colorization to the film to create the red planet. And then when we went and scouted it, we'd come to realize that it was just going to be too expensive to do it there. So we started going around looking at various uh, pieces of land where we might grow vegetation and create that world. Eventually, we came around to the fact that we were going to have to build a big section of it. We were I've seriously been working on these trees, painting all this foliage for about six months. We're going to attach three dozen of these leaves to the tree per tree at 175 trees. So it's 500 dozen all together. So we wanted to stick with some tropicals, but one of the things we noticed when we did our tests in Kauai was that there's so many different kinds of leaves that it just kind of became a jumble. So we wanted to bring it down into a certain certain flavor. So the, the flax, which is the, the pointier, the tall ones that you see in there, we, uh, we definitely like those and there's smaller versions of that. Although our island is volcanic based, we wanted a very kind of mossy, soft look. So we actually do have different kinds of moss in there and shag carpet. You name it, we've got it thrown in there. It's great. So our Nibirins, of all the things that we were designing on the show in terms of character, were probably one of the most collaborative and iterative uh, designs. They're very well maintained aliens. This particular design was very challenging because it had changed over the course of time from the very, very beginning of the film when it was all CG to now where it's actual actors in makeup. Just before we get into adjusting his nose or changing things, let's just look and see what he looks like. It would be great to just sort of find something with the most basic version of him so he can really perform it. Can you get closer? Yeah. <laughs> I wanted oh. you to see. <laughs> <laughs> They're basically putting on the base layer of the skin and then they're going to put on some mud and some costume and show me to JJ and see what, uh, what needs to happen from there. I would argue it's, it's probably a better thing to just go all mud, all white, and then the mud paint stuff up. Got it. Of, of these, then, is there direction from just a pure graphic design standpoint? I don't think it's just, think it's just scary. Yeah. It's crazy good. It's, just, it's gonna be amazing. It's really gonna be great, crazy. Can I touch you? Sure. One of the coolest things for me is actually seeing these people in the makeup, them turning into the characters and doing things with it that I never anticipated or even thought of. Three, two, one, action. We're flying the camera. Through set here. Uh, we're hanging on a Tech 12, so nice string, basically rope. And we get to drive it back and forth. We can go up and down. It goes really fast. Fun rig. Which way to go? Which way to go, Jeff? I hate this! Oh no, you do! So we're about to start shooting the volcano part of the opening. The volcano that we built wasn't a massive set, but what we had around it with the embers that special effects put and the pyro, we had so much going on that once 
you put Zach up there in the outfit with the reflections and everything, it just all totally came to life. This is part of the machine that uh, shoots a 30-foot fireball up in the back. It's got big propane bull line going to an accumulator in the back. This plastic tube you see is what we call the tube of death. That we have a blower on one side and we put smoke in it. We pop little holes, we can surround the entire set with it and have this atmosphere smoke constantly instead of a guy running around like we used to do in the olden days. These are our spark emitters. They sift in this activated charcoal. We heat up the tube and then it just goes right out the top. Whoa, it is yeah, insanely hot up here. I'm pulling focus on the A-camera first AC, so it's go my job to put focus on, on the actors, and I can't do it if I'm not in, in good position. So put this fire retardant suit on and, and hat and went in there and did my thing. It's, it's also dreamlike. All the embers just floating. It almost puts you in a trance. We have an amazing helicopter pilot that is flying close to the set. It was one of those moments when you're making a movie saying, uh, this is a really big film. <laughs> thought about it for a long time, you know, creating this suit that Spock would descend into the volcano. And I thought the color copper would be beautiful. Probably the, the, the worst thing that you, you would ever want to wear in a volcano because it, it conducts heat so well. But I just kept thinking about the reflection of the flames and I just thought how beautiful it would be. All of the stuff that took place in the volcano was one night, um, and it was pretty exciting, actually, I have to say, because you could tell how incredible it's going to look. What they were able to do in camera on that particular sequence was mind-blowing to me. That looks hard. Um, it felt like falling into the volcano at high speed. Man. Check it out. It's so good. It feels kind of like I feel like I'm inside a fireworks show. It's just like everywhere I look is sparks and embers and fire and smoke. It's crazy. So we're on the last shot of the volcano sequence, which uh, I think went really, really well. Much more epic than I even thought it would in camera. Here we go, rolling and action. There's been an attack on Starfleet headquarters, and Marcus brings everybody together. Kirk and Spock enter the conference room sequence at odds. Kirk realizes that he's, he just doesn't have the kind of friendship with Spock he thought he did, and maybe Spock is incapable of that. When the attack happens, the fight sort of goes away, and it becomes grappling with this urgent life and death situation. The death of Pike is an experience that they share, but also is a kind of game changer for them. So today we're just getting ready for a nice little explosion scene. Cameras in mark! Action! Three, two, one, pop! Action scenes are a lot of fun. They, uh, they choreograph it as much as they can with where the explosions are going to come, what's going to happen. And that will happen in the desk in front of Bruce and Mike. Marie is on the right to take him back into the wall like she's been hit front on and is pushed back into the wall. Big thing is timing. Big thing is not kicking this actor in the face over here. I've got an actor probably two feet off my left side. And also, don't kick that light out and don't break the table. Conference room set seems very easy, but was actually a, a big deal to you know construct that. This is going to be amazing. Two levels. 
And so we'll have, uh, See the markers we'll, have both, the moment, we'll have black and yeah. What we'd like to do is obviously build a rig that will do everything. We'll move, move around, around, move around right. shine the lights and do all of that stuff. We had the ship outside on this rig that was basically just lights. But what it did is it created the illusion of this massive ship outside that was flying and hovering outside and firing into the room. It was another example of having a practical thing there. It just gave the whole sequence a much more frightening reality. It looked the way it would have looked as opposed to having the whole thing comped in later in, in visual effects. It just gave the whole thing a real kind of gritty authenticity. Oh, it's very exciting. been contemplating this since last May or so. It's fun to really see it all come together, especially when it gets lit for the first time. And you really see it come to life because Dan does such great things. It's really great. Then the next step, of course, is blowing it up. All right, this is the process we're using for our marble wall hits. We have eight different uh, hits in the wall. We have a little piece of this stuff that's very lightweight. It's got the pyrocell inside of it. Put it in the wall, send it to the painters. Can, can't even see it's there. The A7 was my favorite so far. <clears throat> Here's one. I just like watching him get hit. <laughs> that's right, Bill. <laughs> Bill's just like, shoot me again, I'm good. Kill Bill? Yeah. We could load that and just blow the debris out again, and you already have a perfect hole. So. <laughs> we need an air defense team! Take the project bro! That was good. Cut. Yeah, it's great. And they had that. We had the other one. Awesome. Okay, good. Great job. The crawling around and dodging all the all the explosions was fun and bruising, and you know, getting hooked up to those yankomatics. Yeah, yeah, dragging yourself around the rubbery broken glass. With the flame balls attached to the back of the desk, I was hunkering down behind you. Feel the whole desk. Okay. It's a whole different deal. This is all just reacting. It's fun. Really fun. Basically, we have a piece of tempered glass and we have some detonators on the glass. Our cue will fire the detonators and the shock from those will shatter the glass. All right, and then we have uh, air mortars that'll help put pressure on the glass to drive it out that way. Major eyes, please, attention. Glass breaks. Real right. glass? Uh, tempered glass. Tempered yeah. glass, yeah. Real tempered glass. Tempered glass. Yeah. He throws the gun down like so, but it didn't break it. He runs over here. Eight Start seconds for the thing to push in. 20 seconds to go. <laughs> What happens, the actor touches his hand to it, it sucks back about an inch and a half, and immediately opens up super fast. This was originally supposed to be an element that was gonna be done in CG, but somehow my superior convinced them to do this practically, which became a very, very fun and challenging project. Now we're gonna do uh, everything else that we have in two takes, lasting 30 seconds. Got multiple cameras on it, and it should be great. Here we go. Three, two, one, six. doing something that's like an action sequence, it's fun first. And then you get exhausted because you're just doing all these little pieces. It takes an hour to do one second piece. And then you want to do a dramatic piece. Then you get to a dramatic piece and you're just dying to do little pieces. We are inheriting Star Trek. You know, if we don't embrace and use the elements that are familiar to the world of Trek, what are we doing? We, we should do something else and call it something else. Klingons are ingrained in the tapestry of Star Trek as any other villain, so you desperately want to get them in sooner than later. I do think that the idea of doing Star Trek and bringing Klingons into the world is an obvious and cool challenge and how do you do it? And we were very lucky to have Neville Page and David Anderson work on bringing the Klingons to life. You gotta pay respect to who the Klingons are, but also do something new, but don't violate the, the lore and the culture and the history of them. It's always that delicate balance. 
One of the early notions that I had was that they might be at war with themselves as well, much the way that we are on our planet, to the point that the things we do also destroy our planet. And I thought it might be interesting that the spot of Kronos that we were in was this toxic wasteland, like post-nuclear bomb disaster. So this whole thing is on our stage? This whole, crazy this whole thing is on our stage. Wow. Kronos, again, was, you know, going back to the idea that we build, we try and build whenever possible. Even as a model, you'd have meetings after meetings after meetings about it, and you would see the model, but you don't quite understand the scale of it. I couldn't even compute what it would look like in the finished form. A lot of the visual effects would be in actually getting there. And once you arrive there, once you've established this kind of enormous space, then a lot of it we were hoping we could shoot in camera. And so the art department, Andrew Murdoch and those guys, built this huge set. I remember walking on the stage the first time seeing the cutouts to show us the scale of it, and it was massive. I think the stage is you know, 40,000 feet or so, and we filled every inch of that stage. It really was amazing. And that light that Chris Pamperin and Dan built was this huge yellow light on the wall with whatever it was, over a million watts of electricity. There are about 1,200 pars up there on a the wall that are shining through this lens to create this gigantic light source from a very short distance. 30 moving lights, and then uh, about 75 top lights, not to mention various side lights, strobes, and probably another you know, 150, 200 park hands around the set. Even though people associate Star Trek and science fiction films with a lot of visual effects, there's no doubt a lot of hand work and heavy craft work done on these sets. You know, for instance, you can see the sculptors back here working on this huge wall that we've designed. So um, there's a lot of craft, which is awesome. We love it. How are you? Get him his name straight. But we spent next these days. Who are you? Very hard. This is Tommy. JJ. I'm JJ. It's like it's like <laughs> Sports <laughs> Illustrated for Clinton. Mary. You look so handsome. I don't know. That was Spock. I'd be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> the costume was created, many of them, and were shot for the first film, but the scene was cut out. Because of time and frankly it felt a little bit off point, and so even though I loved the costumes Michael Kaplan designed, we cut the sequence. I was quite disappointed, as was JJ, because it was one of his favorite costumes. He said, don't worry, they'll work in the next film. We never saw them without their helmets on. And so in this movie, we had to figure out what do they look like when the helmets come off, which we definitely wanted to do. And so David Anderson and Neville Page working together came up with a great design and a great makeup. It's, it's really what defines the Klingons, kind of their forehead and their hair. So in looking at the forehead, I thought it'd be interesting if that forehead ridge shape continues all the way around the back of the head. Uh, the piercings, the idea behind that is kind of like marking the side of your your World War II bomber with victories. They mark their bodies with victories, uh, either with piercings or scarification. We then will print out three-dimensional models as reference models that I will give to the makeup department. And the makeup department will then interpret those on top of our selected actors. Okay. Good morning, afternoon, what's up? We're about to make a transformation. Yeah, this makeup is a long one. This one actually takes about four and a half hours. Yeah, it's one of those old oh professions. Gosh, yeah. Prosthetic makeup where yeah. actors suffer for their art. <laughs> yes. And it gets hot. The jewelry is the last touch here. Now I am officially blinged out. <laughs> you know, it sort of honors what has come before, but like in the many different series, they were all very different. We followed suit. And so, you know, the look that you see in the movie, I think, is uh, pretty cool. Uh, intimidating look and you know the need to withstand the scrutiny of IMAX so the makeup had to be great and the application had to be great which I think David really did an amazing job with. You gotta get mech, mech. Yach, mech, mech. Mech, mech, mech. Rach, the shamech. Edge, dodge me, which we talk, kamech. Not there, we go to. Right, perfect. There's an argument about sort of which is the true Klingon language. It's been featured in the Star Trek franchise 
uh, in varying forms of uh, correctness. I let that fight be fought uh, without me. I actually made up Klingon for all the Star Trek films, so I guess I'm the go-to guy. So I guess no one can complain if this doesn't sound right to them. Oh, they can complain. They'll definitely be able to complain, and I'll have to explain to them why it's, it's right anyway. She's learning lines incredibly well. She's a very, very quick learner. She's pronouncing them right. It's like zip, zip, zip. You know, I'm impressed. That's one of them. Marks, please. Here we go. Okay. Grab her face, please, sir. It's always scary at first, but you're so curious to get into it and to really know what every word means, and that way you get the intonation right. And then once you know your costumes are on and you've rehearsed it, then it's like you put in all the passion, and it just sounds really exciting. Zoe, who did such an amazing job with you know all the Navi stuff in Avatar, once again proved that she's really good at learning alien languages. But now I must go shoot something else. So join me, shall you? Camera, Fifty years of Star Trek that had existed before we came into it, we wanted to play in harmony with what is known as Star Trek canon, um, and that meant that we had an enormous amount to draw from. Whereas there was really only one story we felt we could tell in the first one, there were a million in the second. There are a number of characters we could have used, and there are a number of issues that we talked about in terms of Khan, and, and one of them was, why do that? Why bring him back? We would established a brand new sort of timeline, we could do anything we want, let's just do something brand new. But the truth is that no one resonated like Khan. There was such a, a personal connection between Khan and Kirk. Khan, you still remember Admiral? To me, it was the combination of the opportunity of taking something that was extraordinarily rich and mythic and also update it not only with a new actor, but to take the character and sort of use that character in a way that hadn't been used before. He was really the one character that we were going to completely reinvent the way we tried to reinvent the main characters. Mr. Spock, in your travels, did you ever encounter a man named Khan? Originally, the, the, the first thing we thought of was, you know, who are the actors that we thought would feel as we did with the first, you know, film, in the spirit of what had come before. Damon mentioned Ben Cumberbatch, and I, I watched him, and he was so not the Khan that I knew at all. And so on that level, I thought, oh, well, we're definitely going to get in trouble because, you know, fans of it are going to say, oh, he looks nothing like it. It makes no sense. But the truth is, I think if something is good, that sort of supersedes everything. This felt like the righteous way to go because he was so damn good. I got a call saying um, they are considering you to play the baddie in the next Star Trek film, I went, well, as in the J.J. Abrams franchise. And I went, yeah. I went, oh, nice. Um, can I see a script? No. Can I see something? No. Well, who am I playing? We can't tell you. <laughs> Green Benedict Butch. Cumberbatch. Yes, Cumberbatch. You know, he's flying over right now. He's like, Zachary Quinto. <laughs> King, You're King, mine. Quinto. <laughs> <laughs> You're going down. <laughs> I am literally, pretty much literally off the boat. So it's about 12 o'clock, even though it's only, what is it here? It's tea time here, isn't it, really? So I'm, uh, I'm kind of in a daze. I'm in a bit of a dream. And it all feels a bit surreal. You know, Benedict's a very kind of casual, easygoing guy, and to see Khan come to life, and it was like, he all of a sudden stood up straighter, and his, you know, back was like ramrod straight, and his head would tilt in these precise angles, and it just was so much fun to watch. Why aren't we moving? An unexpected malfunction, perhaps in your warp core. There's a lot of power in stillness, and Benedict certainly understands that. And in a big, huge action movie like this, I think those moments can sometimes be the most resonant for the audience because it, it requires them to lean in. John Hurt was the fiction created by your Admiral Marcus. A smoke screen to conceal my true identity. My name is Khan. 
the big line in this movie is, my name is Khan. We knew that if we were able to nail that moment, that it would be a huge, you know, like there'd be a gasp from the audience or applause from people who really wanted that to happen or boos from people who just hated us for doing it. When I read that in the script, I just leapt off my seat and screamed at the top of my voice. I remember thinking the people in the room next to me must think someone's being murdered. I had no choice but to escape alone. We needed to make this character talk about himself and what his past was to both huge fans of Trek who are gonna be just rubbing their hands together going, oh my God, I know what the Botany Bay is. I understand why that guy in that torpedo is frozen and why there are 72 of them and someone who didn't know any of these things. If you want to know why I did what I did, go and take a look. Give me one reason why I should listen to you. I can give you 72. Who is this man who has been brought back from death, has been defrosted and aligned to play a, a spearheading role in militarizing Starfleet and creating weapons of mass destruction as well as heading up an army of elite warriors? I had every reason to suspect that Marcus had killed every single one of the people I hold most dear. The character of Khan needs to have melodrama to him, um, he's got to be hyper real, but at the same time it's got to be really relatable. So the, the fun surprise is when he says, is there anything you would do for your family in a very relatable and an emotional way. So you kind of can't deny him because what he's saying is something that we all feel. My crew is my family, Kirk. Is there anything you would not do for your family? He's dealt quite a rough hand. Maybe I'm just saying that because I'm the man who plays it. He does open fire on an unarmed room of Starfleet commanders. But his hands, in my eyes, as a character, are utterly tied by what Marcus is doing. Khan is almost a weapon, and Alexander Marcus is the human that uses that weapon. Normally in a popcorn summer movie, you want to know who your bad guy really is. And here we have two guys that are candidates for who the villain is. While Khan may in fact be the same Khan that you know from the Wrath of Khan, his motivations are extremely different. And he was used by the real big bad of our movie. And that real big bad is Admiral Marcus. Kirk, you want to take him out? You park on the edge of the neutral zone. You lock on to Harrison's position. You fire, you kill him, and you haul ass. The guy who's playing the antagonist cannot look at his part as an antagonist. Everybody from the inside out looks like a protagonist. All Alexander Marcus is trying to do, he's not doing evil for evil's sake. He's a guy who really believes that what he's doing is patriotic. In this movie, you're really questioning, what do I do in this situation? Where does your loyalty lie? Who do you trust? It's an infinitely more kind of complex and in some ways darker story than the first movie. He's playing you, son, don't you see that? Khan and his crew were condemned to death as war criminals. And now it is our duty to carry out that sentence before anybody else dies because of him. Give him to me so that I can end what I started. Launching activation sequence on three, two, one. It began with an idea that we do a ship-to-ship -ship sequence to get them from one place to another as sort of quickly and invisibly as possible. I mean, we kind of done some of that with the drill platform thing last time. So I think Chris Pine and all the other guys involved are used to or were up for doing that. Previs is basically the ability to make your movie before the movie is made. And what the process allows us to do is figure out shot by shot in an edit, you know, what your final product is going to be. We have Khan and Kirk flying from one ship to another. What is that going to look like? Ultimately, all we had were two guys hanging on a wire in front of a green screen. What's the best way to lens and tell that story? One of the great things about Previs is it's a fantastic communication tool. You know, if you do a Previs and say, this is what I want to achieve, then everyone can look at the Previs and go, OK, I need to have a flying guy, and there's a monkey in this shot, and there's whatever else it is. And we actually had it down to the lens. So the lenses that we used actually matched the lenses they used on set. So when they got on set, they knew exactly what lens to put on. <laughs> Uh, we have tons of massive debris flying through the space. We had to figure out how the actors were going to interact with it. What's moving is the background is moving. 
So we're moving background and we're putting little meteors and dust and debris. All of that has to be figured out. Captain, there is debris directly ahead. Copy that. You have nothing to work with. You have two guys hanging on a wire. We have to know what they're reacting to. The actors need to know what they're reacting to. JJ would, you know, figure out, well, they need to fly right, they need to fly left to sort of dodge what's happening. Then we would just separate it out beat by beat and make a plan for how to shoot it. Three, two, one, yank. Imminent collision detected. Khan, use evasive action. There is debris directly ahead. I see it. That tail mark, yeah? Same crack, my Chris. Focus. Yeah. Debris action. Flying debris, debris. Debris, debris, and bang! And using previs, you know, it allows us to get those moments and figure out when the actor has to react to like something hitting his mask. Down at the crack, the Scotty line, please, Chris. Scotty, you're gonna be ready with that door, right? It's it's just a little tough because they're standing there, you know, on a green screen stage and they're pretending to fly between the ships. But I mean, the actor's just so fantastic at doing it. They're they're up for any any of it. Now we're going to transition from flying through space into the vengeance. JJ really wanted it to be in camera if we could possibly do it. I mean, the approach to it was, for us, was always try to do as much as you can in camera and try to get as much on screen. Shooting real elements adds a truth to the scene that you can't get any other way. I love when they, people can't tell. They say, what part of this is CG, what part of this is real, and they, they guess wrong. It's my favorite thing. So we are in a... Uh a warehouse where uh, the Spruce Goose was built and it is a giant, ugly, old wooden warehouse. Now it's ugly only because it's supposed to be a very cool, sexy, dark, scary, modern ship. So what we decided to do was build this basically this sort of runway area, light it, and just leave, every, leave everything else black. In the background there's just oh, gack and stuff for the stunt team. But we're just backlighting it so it just looks like cool stuff. When JJ told us what he wanted us to do, all of us were standing there going, it's not gonna work. We were all standing in this gigantic, light-colored wood warehouse where JJ's notion was, we weren't gonna green screen really anything. We are gonna turn the lights off, make the floor black, and shoot the whole environment as is, and somehow through the magic of stage lighting and set design and how you frame the camera, we would need to do virtually no post-production in it. The, the trick of the scene is to sort of say, this kind of architecture exists in the space, but this is the whole space. That way, when we're into closer shots, longer lens, where we can see some of the actual stuff, it's all in camera, we would go, oh, I get what, what they're in, and it looks cool. Yeah, no, I, I, if we can establish there may be some walls, yeah. but there are these different areas, yeah. you'll, when you see this, you'll never, we should, we'll just work backwards, we'll look at the footage, and we'll, go, right. and we'll go, this is what we need to say it is. I may have been the only one, but to the moment we started shooting, I thought, mm, disaster, disaster, disaster. And then the, the camera started rolling, and I was watching the monitor going, well, that worked, but. You know, that's not going to work, and then that worked. I was like, shit. <laughs> that was another in camera thing that was insane was the guys flying along at enormous speed along on these wires as they came into the ship. We were on the floor doing the slide in because Jay's had this brilliant idea of pulling Colin, one of the brilliant camera operators, back along the floor on his belly with a camera. and. Khan's all in control and very serious, as if he's done it before, it's all about being in control. And Kirk's going <laughs> And I got up and was like, did, did you see that? Did, did, did you ever see that? Did you ever, it was just, it was like test riding uh, an adventure theme ground ride. It looked fantastic, you know, even without the wires painted out, it looked genuinely thrilling. I was quite jealous. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. You know what? Welcome aboard. The action in this movie, the scale of the movie, is without question light years beyond what we did in the first movie. It's, it is a far more ambitious movie. The original idea of the third act didn't have us landing on Earth. 
JJ said, now this really excites me. Most of the Star Trek, a lot of the big dangerous things happen in deep space, but to bring it into your backyard is different. Set destination, Starfleet headquarters. Maybe what we'll do is he'll give you guys some numbers. So like sort of one, it's like you're looking to, some other people turn to look. If at the beginning of the shot, no one's looking back that way, and at the end of the shot, everyone is, that would be pretty awesome. And would probably make it to the trailer. And let's, let's, let's do a trailer shot. Three, two, one, bang! We're shooting a huge scene here in Los Angeles at CAA headquarters with about 150 extras. We have six cameras, all large IMAX cameras. Uh, we have both units shooting side by side, and it's a huge day for us. Crew size today is probably close to 450. Mm, he's possibly faster. Than that, so. You have to lock up every street. We've got 17 policemen today on motorbikes to lock the street up. It it's gone very well today, I'm very happy. Here we are, Santa Monica, Century City, and we're going to shoot Mr. Khan blowing through those doors. He makes his way up the stairs. He's going to run through those double glass doors and blow through that thing, that big stunt. The glass that they put in there, they're going to have a charge, so just as he's about to approach it, blow the glass and he's going to travel through. It's going to be awesome. Generally, it's really great to be back. It's a lot of work. And this time, like, I know what I'm in for. Last time, I didn't know what I was in for, which I think helps me, actually, because last time, I was really hard on myself, and I was really trying to push myself for, like, immediate results. This time, it's much more about building from where I am and trusting that everything will fall into place. Drop the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm most excited about cultivating that sense of discipline again and being here every day and working for a few hours. I can pick stuff up really fast, but I gotta work really hard to make it look easy. That's gonna be the biggest challenge for me is to sort of get all this movement in my body in a way that's organic. Well, eventually I'm gonna probably be over there. Toward the end of the film, Spock and Khan have a pretty epic battle the fight takes place on top of a garbage truck in the future, so the supposition is that the garbage trucks sort of hover and float through the city. The way that they built it on a turntable so that they could use the available sunlight and adjust to the sun moving through the sky throughout the day. I mean, the amount of ingenuity and expertise that went into building that set was kind of unfathomable to me. It's actually brilliant. You know, we're taking care of each other. We have to, we're doing this for four days straight, so it's painful just doing that 20 times in the space of an hour in very hot Californian sun, and it, it starts to take its toll. A lot of the people working on this movie come from a classically trained background, so we've all done a lot of theater. We all understand how important it is to be able to integrate our bodies with our work on film, and, uh, and that was something that was really helpful when we were shooting that sequence. <laughs> Oh, it's great, dude. Awesome. Yes. Great. Good, right? When they built the set, they built it knowing that there was going to be a big fight on here. So some of the stuff has been rubberized, like you look down here. You shouldn't give away those secrets and just pretend they're actually landing on steel. Yeah, some of it does hurt. Daniel and Martin are awesome and there for us to sort of refine every move as we're executing it. Zach and I have been doing definitely the majority of it, which is great. There are leaps they went and asked to do, like that leap. I'd like to do it. It's easy enough to do, but it's the thing of repeatedly doing it. And all you'd have to do is land slightly awkwardly. Your ankle goes and... Khan's an incredibly powerful character, but so is Spock. They just have different strengths. There's a lot of precision and a lot of rapid fire thinking that happens with Spock, so he's able to anticipate. And I think Khan is a little bit more brute force passionate and aggressive, and so the combination of those forces came together in a pretty exciting way, I think, for that sequence. Spock is now fighting to avenge his best friend, and so he fights out of heart, and Spock now becomes a little savage, which is pretty cool. It was really fun. It was hard getting myself physically ready for that was the biggest challenge of the movie, but also probably one of the biggest rewards, because it allowed me to really connect with the character in a different way, and connect with myself as an actor and my process in a different way. The, the spectacle 
is all great and fun, but to me, if you don't love and care about the characters and what they're going through, um, you know, nothing else really matters. Stop! He's our only chance to save Kirk!